Thank you.
So we're trying to, uh, we want to make sure, we want to thank all those who couldn't be here tonight and who are coming to us or, or are watching online. So just thank you guys. Can we welcome them real quick? People who couldn't make it. So tonight, uh, I'm going to be joined by my lovely wife, Jill, uh, as we talk about marriage. And so <clears throat> we've got a handful of speakers tonight. Uh, <clears throat> we've got myself, my wife, we're going to talk a little bit about marriage. Uh, we have Jessica Hagen and, uh, and Brian Meyer. They're going to talk about finance. We have Eric Simpson. Eric, where are you at? He's going to be talking about celebrate recovery. And then Tom's going to wrap us up at the end there. So uh, just we have a really great lineup of speakers. And so uh, we're going to go ahead and get right after it. Uh, <clears throat> oftentimes, my wife and I, when we're talking to couples about marriage, uh, we often go back to, what is your relationship with Christ like? And they're like, well, what does that have to do with our arguments about money? Or what does that have to do with our arguments about parenting? And it really has a lot to do, a lot to do with it. And so some people are coming here and you guys are saved. Some people you're not. Maybe you've never heard the gospel. So I just kind of want to quickly go over that so we can all have the same baseline. First of all, we are all sinful, broken people. And when you put two sinful, broken people together, you're going to have conflict. And that includes my wife and I. You know, we look in Genesis 3 and we see that we're in a fallen world. And it's not a world as God has designed. We look at, you know, the fact that we are all sons of Adam and daughters of Eve who are broken. And we're all sinful. We see in Romans 3.10 that no one is righteous. No, not one. And then later, 13 verses later, uh, Paul writes in 3.23, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. So none of us have it all together. Not me, not my wife, not anyone here, not anyone that's outside this building. None of us have it all together. And it even says here that in Isaiah 64, 6, that our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. And that's a PG version. That's a really disgusting item. So on our very best day, our very best second, very best moment of all of us together, none of us have what it takes. So that's a problem. But the good news is, is that Christ is enough. And so we read, a lot of folks have seen John 3.16 on bumper stickers or on uh, coffee mug. But uh, I, I want to put it into context and, and, and extend that and go to John 3.16 and 17. So just, if you have your Bible, please open it up. Uh, you'll see that I'm not making this up. I'm reading from the ESV, okay? So, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So that, that's the one we're all familiar with. 17, though, I love, because it says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. That's good news. But the problem is, is that there's some people who don't know Jesus. And if you don't know Jesus, please don't leave here tonight without asking somebody about Jesus. Because the terrifying thing is, when, when Jesus says in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, he says, and again, this is terrifying. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the ones who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many, wor do many mighty works in your name? And this is where it gets really terrifying. I don't wish this on anyone. In verse 23, it says, Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So from there, where do we go? What do we do? And we, and we can spend all night unpacking the gospel, but that's not what we're here for. But you believe, you repent, you confess, and you get baptized. And if you don't know Jesus, if, 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 this is, if this is foreign to you, please don't leave tonight without asking somebody. Because we want to make that our baseline. So as we dive in uh, to tonight, uh, our message, uh, for those A-typers out there, type A people, you want to know where I'm going? We're going to talk about Christ in the church. We're going to talk about conflict resolution, and we're going to talk about covenant. And we're going to come from Ephesians 5, 21 through 33. So my, my better half is going to read that. Um, yep. Um, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. What am I reading to you? Yep, all the way to 31, 33. Uh, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and, his, and is himself its savior. <laughs> Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, 
because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each of you, each one of you, love his wife as himself, and let his wife see that she respects her husband. So we just want to start with God's word, because God's word is true. God's word is sufficient. God's word is inerrant, infallible. And so we either believe that or we don't, because if it's not truth, then what? Then our, our own truth, our own belief is relative, and it's relativism, it's postmodernism. And so if, if you're not landing on truth, then, then, then your truth is your truth, and my truth is my truth, and that just doesn't make any sense. And again, with 100% grace, 100% truth, we just want to start with by, by talking about God's word. And so I'm going to do a brief, uh, you guys may be familiar with a soap study, scripture, observe, apply, and then pray, but uh, we're going to pray out the very end of this, so... I'm just going to do the first three. But as we can see there, uh, we're going to see in many of these cases that Christ led the way, and we're to follow him. When he says, follow me, that he means follow him. And so Ephesians, uh, or excuse me, uh, so starting with this, uh, we, we, need to, we need to understand that we, we need to start with God. We need to put God at the center of our marriage, and we need to lead with love. Uh, you know, just right there in, in Mark 12, 20, 12, 29 through 31, he talks about love God, love your neighbor. And so we just want to start there with that. And uh, so as we dive in, Ephesians 5.21, this is for everybody. Because we have reverence for Christ, we submit to one another. That's everybody. Wives, in Ephesians 5.22, because you submit to the Lord, submit to your husbands. Ephesians 5.23, Christ is head of the church, and husbands are head of the wife. Ephesians 5.24, church submits to Christ, wives submit to their husbands. So there's a lot of submitting there, and, and that's been weaponized against women for, for many years, and if that's your, that's your story, I hope that's not your story, because that's not the truth, because if you notice, 521, before we went through all that, it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So there's many times to, to put that into application. Uh, we went on vacation in November. Uh, it, was a no, it was a vacation she'd been planning on for years, and uh, bottom line, it wasn't a vacation I had wanted. It wasn't a vacation I had envisioned, but because I love my wife, I said, you know what? You've been planning this for a long time. It meant a lot to her, and I said, okay, let's, let's do what you got. Let's, let's do what you want to do. So that, that, that's just an application piece where it's you got to communicate. you got to have those conversations. And you got to go back and say, look, the Bible is, this is what the Bible says. This is the truth, and we're going to land on the truth. So for husbands, we've got a few things in there. Christ loved the church. So husbands, love your wives because Christ loved. And so because Christ loved and we're called to follow him, we need to love our wives. It doesn't say, you know, when you feel like it. No, if you're a husband here today, go home and love your wife. Let her know you love her. Speak her love languages. If you're not familiar with that, I would love to talk to you after this. There's ways you can talk. You, you, can, you can serve your wife, you know, acts of service, uh, words of affirmation. There's gifts. There's physical touch. And I'm not necessarily talking about sex. And then there's also quality time. So learn to speak your wife's love language. But love because Christ loved us. Husbands, serve, help. Christ came to serve, not to be served. So men, serve, help. Help your wives and help, help your, your relationship become more Christ-like. And then conflict resolution. That, that's, the, that's the second step I want to talk about. I know we're, we're uh, cutting short on time here, or running short on, uh, to the t- on time, but I just want to kind of talk about conflict resolution. In Ephesians 5.28, Jill just read, uh, love our wives. And that's because he loved us. And that, that's because we love ourselves, that we need to love our wives because you are one flesh. So love your wife. Speak her love language. And then in Ephesians 5, 29 through 30, because Christ nourishes us and cherishes us, husbands, if you're a husband out there, cherish and nourish your wife because you are one flesh. In those moments where there's conflict happening all around you, arguments about kids, about sex, about finances, love your wife, nourish your wife. Speak her love language. Let her know that she's loved. And then lastly, my last C is covenant. This is not a contract. When you get married, it's, it's not a contract. There's not penalties. There's I'm in it for the, for the long haul. You're one flesh, exclusivity, one man, one woman. You know, when I, when I took my vows, I, I wrote them down here. You know, Tommy, will you take this woman as your wife to live with, to hold from this day forward? Will you love her, comfort her, guide her, protect her, lead her? Never forsake her. Keep her honor. Keep her in sickness and in health as long as you both shall live. Will you lead her through the scriptures and lead her in ways of God? And if so, answer, I do. And I do. And she, she took the same vow. Uh, so, or she took the same uh, declaration of consent is what they normally call that. 
But then when we get down to our vows, again, th- these, are not, these are not contracts. These are very covenant in nature. So I say, I, Tommy, take you, Jill, to be my wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, until death do us part. As God is my witness, I give you my promise. So when you're, when you're going through this summer and you're trying to guard your marriage, remember, this is a covenant. It's not a contract. It's not because she did something or I didn't do something. We're in it to win it. We are in it for the long haul. We are in it thick and thin, good times and bad. And then lastly, uh, in Ephesians 5.31, it talks about, <coughs> you know, uh, when Jill was talking about uh, leaving and cleaving, uh, leaving your family behind. You know, men and, and women, we, we leave our families behind. We leave the old, and we hold fast to our spouse. We fully trust and we fully commit to them in these moments during that conflict, during the good times, during the bad. We are one. There's not two anymore. You know, I, I, I just uh, I read a unity candle thing for a couple who got married a few weeks ago, and, and one thing uh, was brought to my attention about flames, and that is when you have a unity candle, it's two flames coming to one. Well, when you have a one flame, you can't separate that. At least you can't separate it without getting burned, getting burned bad. Okay? It's two flames. Now you got one flame. You are one, and you can't separate it. Ephesians 5.32, marriage, represents Christ and the church. This is the purpose of marriage. The purpose of marriage is not for me to be a better husband or for her to be a better wife. The purpose of our marriage is to help each other become more Christ-like and to be more Christ-like. And then lastly, in Ephesians 5.33, Love because you because you love yourself, self-preservation. We all love ourselves. We all like there, there's a reason why we pursue pleasure and avoid pain. So because you love yourself and because you're one flesh, go love your wife. Go out there and go love your husband. You're one flesh. Take care of the one flesh. Pour into the one flesh. Heal the one flesh. Ask questions. Seek out your spouse and pour into them. And then lastly, church represents the church respects Christ. And so because the church respects Christ, because Christ led the way, wives respect your husband. Love and respect. Put God first. Practice your promise. And you got a whole summer. And don't forget to inject some serious fun. I love you guys. If you guys have any questions, I'd love to talk to you afterwards. Thank you for calling Money. I'm here to give you financial advice to make your life better and you better at life. This is Money. How can I help you? Karen, what? Get out of here. Karen, we have not talked since your piggy bank days. How are you? Hello, this is Money. It's a great day to be green. Yes, the environment is important to, uh, I was referring to green, the color of my shirt, which you cannot see, uh, and the fact that I am the embodiment of money. Uh, I should get a better slogan. Absolutely, Kevin, I can tell you your net worth right now. It's nothing. Yeah, no, like 0.00. But listen, hey, even though you're technically worth nothing in like, you know, dollars and cents, did I ever tell you how much our friendship means to me? It is this much. I don't know, Karen, at the end of the day, what's the real difference between the 10 and the 11 Pro X? Whoa, three lenses. We just have to tool around with your financial plan, but we can get it, all right? Yeah, your security code is 616. Oh, you just bought it just now, that was quick, okay. Uh, Well, can we talk about your new plan? Karen? Karen, hello? It's weird as if you like hung up the moment I said plan. Uh, You spent $72.34. Can I just say, that's a lot of McFlurries for any one person, you know? Listen, Sonia. I know we've been on the rocks, but I don't want to give up on us, okay? I'm just asking that you check up on me every now and again. If you don't talk to me, I can't help you. Leon, hey, oh my gosh. That's a lovely boat, man. A power boat for a power man, and that is you, buddy. Yeah, uh uh-huh. You want to buy it? (laughs) That's a good joke. Oh, you're serious. Okay, Um, well, if we do want to go ahead with it, we're going to have to make some changes. Uh, So that probably means no more food, shelter, or water. Mm Mm-hmm, yeah. No, you're right, it's a gorgeous boat, just like you. Okay, all right. Well, I'll I'll talk to you later. He bought that boat. Look, it's your money at the end of the day, but I'm just trying to give you advice to help your Washingtons become Lincolns, you feel me? And then those Lincolns can maybe one day become Hamiltons. And then those Hamiltons can become Ulysses S. Grants. That's the 50, the $50 bill. Mm -hmm. And then those Ulysses can become 
Benjamins! Woo -hoo -hoo! Oh man, Karen, you're the best. No, you are. No, you are. Man, I'm so glad we took the time to reconnect. Let's do it again sometime soon. How about tomorrow? Okay, we all have that little guy that likes to sit on our shoulder and fight with the other one on the other shoulder. If he would just speak a little louder sometimes. Um, I just wanna take a few minutes to share with you how you can create the best summer ever when it comes to handling your finances. Money is a very sensitive topic for most people, but the way we handle our finances impacts so much more than just our wallets. There's two different ways that we can look at our finances two different lenses. We have the worldly lens and we have the biblical lens. When we view our finances through the worldly lens, this is where we may see the little toddler within all of us that throws the grocery store tantrum. We want something, we want it now, we want it right now. We justify our irresponsibility and consumption of debt. We have to keep up with the Joneses so we live paycheck to paycheck. Truth be told, 80% of Americans live this way. Most of us don't know any other way. We convince ourselves that this is normal and that's just how life works. You'll talk to people and you hear, how you doing? Live in the dream, someone else's dream, but live in the dream. That's because we consume every bit of what we have. But we can swap out our lenses. We can turn our lens over to the biblical lens. This is where we learn to this is what we learn and walk through in our series, If Money Talked. This changes everything we ever thought we knew about money. We learn contentment, which helps to clear, clearly define our wants versus our needs. Just as Psalm 24, verse 1 states, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. That includes money. We are simply managers of God's money. The biblical lens also allows us to put God at the center of our finances, enabling us to create better habits, make better financial decisions, be better examples for everyone around us, and give from our hearts. Matthew 6 verse 21 says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Take that verse for just one second and apply that to your finances. If you take a look at, let's say, two months worth of bank statements, identify the top five things you spend money on, does that accurately represent the five most important things in your life? The thing is, if we don't learn how to manage our money or God's money, which is what it really is, then it will manage us. It's not just a simple swap out your lens, have a different perspective, and voila, all your money woes, all your money questions, everything's perfect. It, it doesn't work that way. But when we change our perspective, it becomes easier to change our habits, and in turn, it becomes easier to make better financial decisions consistently. So how do we create the best summer ever? First, we need to think ahead. What's coming up this summer? What are some extra expenses that we may have that we don't normally have? Do we have camps, uh, kids clothes? The kids grow every year. They change the size every year. You can try to stop it, it's not gonna happen, I've tried. So there's gonna be things that come up that we don't plan for it. and especially if you don't have a plan have a budget in place now what are you going to do when those things come up if you plan for them it's going to be easier it's not going to it's going to hit less it's not going to make such an impact on your daily life or your income or maybe we need to realign our top five to match what is truly important to us we might just need to switch out our lens completely and focus more on God whatever steps you need to take put God at the center Pray on it and trust him. I promise that is one choice you will never regret. There's one additional step though that you really are gonna wanna make note of and that is to sign up for our next session of If Money Talked and Brian's gonna give you all the details on that. So yes, our class If Money Talked, it's a four week session. Uh, it's based on the If Money Talked uh, material from Andy Stanley, which what you saw was just an intro video most of the class is discussion though, after uh, Andy has about a 10 minute video each week, and then we have discussions going through the material with you. And what we're gonna focus on is those biblical principles that Jesus had when he was here in teaching. And 
we're not going to delve into your personal finances. We're gonna have you, you know, do homework to look at your spending, to look at your, um, your past spending, to then develop a spending plan going forward so you can start making better choices, more biblical, biblically based choices. Uh, but again, those are your numbers that are yours. We're not gonna be digging into your business. We're just here to encourage and to help you. And then we have our group discussion on those topics. If you would uh, be interested in joining us, we are gonna start in August again. We're gonna meet, we just said, once a month mm -hmm. uh, for the four months. So that way you have time to build your, look at your spending and then also to build your budget going forward. So we're not uh, just going week after week. You have time to, to develop because each month is a little bit different and it takes several months of working on a budget to get to the point where you're really comfortable with it and working the plan uh, that's best for you. And one of the things that I really uh, got a lot from uh, from this material with uh, Andy Stanley is the last lesson, the one thing he talks about in giving uh, is he wants you to flip the script because normally we spend for me, 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 me. If there's anything left, we save a little bit, which is also for me, and then we get to giving. But he wants us to flip that because Jesus wants us, you know, he told us in Mark that the greatest commandment was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Or are we really loving others if all they're getting out of our budget or our spending is those crumbs that are left at the end? We want to flip that so we put giving as a priority at the top, then our savings because you know, we need to plan for the future. We don't want to be a burden on society or to our families, but then our everyday spending. In in that last lesson, he, in talking about giving, he was talking about giving from a grateful heart and giving from a broken heart. You know, give to things that you're grateful for. What made an impact in your life that you want them to be able to continue to function and to help others the same way they helped you? But then also give to things that break your heart, whether it be you know, water purification or uh, food programs for third world countries, or maybe it's an after school program here in town. But to give the things that really mean something to you so that you're joining with God. Uh, you know, in 2 Corinthians, Paul said, God loves a cheerful giver. Give to things that you see God working with that bring a smile to your face. Be cheerful about your giving, but be biblical in the choices that you make with all of your spending. I'm Eric, a grateful follower of Jesus Christ, and I'm in recovery for chemical dependency. Hey, hey that's better, that's better. Um, so some of you may know I'm a funeral director um, by profession, and there's times like I have to make announcements um, and get up in front of people and just talk real quick, and there's times that I'm so close to almost saying that because I say it so much, and I almost like, you know, in the middle of somebody's funeral tell people that I'm uh, in recovery, so that'll be an awkward situation one day when that actually happens, but... Uh, so when I was, uh, when I was preparing uh, for uh, kind of some material for tonight, I was just trying to think of, you know, relating to recovery, what the summer reminds me of, the changing of a season, and it really just makes me think of a few things. The first thing is, is routine. Um, I say that because in my recovery, routine was a tool that I used to keep me focused on my goals, uh, especially early on. Keeping a structured routine was a way for me to, to schedule my day around doing the right things on a consistent basis. So when my routine was off and I got too tired, too hungry, too stressed, I started to feel vulnerable to falling back into my old ways of navigating life, which was by my own energy and ideas and not by God's power and wisdom. So the summer, you know, the summer brings in a new routine for a lot of people. Uh, people are living differently. Uh, some people have kids at home. Uh, we're all hanging out by the pool, uh, cookouts, vacations. These are, these are all events that have people feeling a little more relaxed, carefree. Um, but for us in recovery, not having thought out plans can end up being more stressful and harmful than anticipated. So for some of us, we've struggled in the midst of our hurts, our habits, and our hangups to find kind of like where we fit in in these events. Um, we now in recovery, though, we, we have the same struggle, but it just feels different. Um, we say things like, how do I have fun without drinking? How do I go to a social event uh, and not have 
anxiety around all these people without having a substance to take the edge off? Uh, will I have the strength to be seen among people who know how broken I once was, who've been with me through my journey? Um, how do I continue to be myself in a new and positive way? Um, these are all thoughts that I've had, and I'm sure many of you have had as well. Um, but I say that to say, don't allow someone else's routine to be what takes you out of yours. Don't allow the work that God is doing in you to now be a place that Satan can grab onto you because you've let your guard down. This is not a way of me trying to convince you not to go out and go to these kind of events uh, and be a part of things. Socially, what I'm saying is, is our hurts and our habits and our hangups uh, do not take breaks. They're always there waiting for the time that we reach out to them for an easy way out to cope like we used to. So I say this to urge you to not take a break on your recovery during the summer. The words renewal, hope, freedom uh, also come to mind when I think of the changing of a season. If you're like me, you tend to set imaginary start dates or guidelines for yourself. I'm sure you've done that before. In my, in my recovery, in my addiction, it looked like uh, on, on Monday, Monday I'm going to stop doing what I was doing when Monday comes around. Or uh, this bottle that I just bought is going to be the last one, and then I quit. As soon as that's done, I'll quit. Or after vacation, I'm going to start eating healthy. I'm going to start taking care of myself. I just need to get through vacation, and then I'll start you know, back on track. In recovery, those, those silly rules that we never follow through with can now be reframed as goals or items on a list of gratitude to God. So the summer can be a time for you to say, my vacation is not going to be just me going somewhere to a resort, to the beach, wherever, to be tempted to do all the things that I said that I wouldn't do again. But instead, I'm going to spend more time in nature and God's creation. I'm going to start my mornings outside in the sun reading God's word. I'm going to surround myself with people who bring out the best of me, but don't make me feel bad about not being who I used to be. So stack your routine with not just things that fulfill you, but the one who fulfills you, and that's Jesus Christ. So I've said this in Celebrate Recovery before, but surrendering isn't a weakness when it's surrendering to God. The surrendering of your struggles to a God that will take those and turn them into an exact, the exact quality which makes you more powerful through him is what empowers us to be truly free. The scars of our former lives are now badges of honor that give God the glory he deserves when we share our story with other people who are hurting. So my hope is that we add this summer, or we add this summer to our gratitude list, that we continue uh, to come out of, this, of summers and new seasons just thanking God for what he did for us in the season. That's all I got. Thank you, guys. Everybody welcome Tom. For those of you who maybe don't know me, I'm Tom Gilbert. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, it's great to have you all here. It's great to be talking about creating the best summer ever, guarding what's important. Um, Eric and I talked a little bit before, and we had some similar talking points, so I may not say anything that's on my notes, but uh, we'll see what happens. Um, as I was thinking about kind of how to explain what we do, I wanted to talk a little bit about care ministry and care night and why we're here. Um, I came on staff about two and a half years ago. Um, we had, at that time, Divorce Care, Grief Share, and Celebrate Recovery had just started. Uh, they were all on separate nights. Um, and it, I just felt God really tugging uh, me toward building community, bringing hurt and broken and lost folks together uh, to heal together, to support one another. And I really want to encourage you, if you're new, uh, maybe you were just new this season for a group, um, we really are a community. Uh, we really want to support one another, and it doesn't matter why you're here. I really like the language from Celebrate Recovery because they talk about if you have any hurt, habit, or hang-up, you belong. Well, I haven't met any human beings yet in my lifetime that don't have a hurt, habit, or hang-up. So everyone's welcome. And the truth of the matter is, if everybody who needed to be here was here, we wouldn't have space in the new auditorium. We'd have to be in the centrum or the main auditorium. 
So you are the folks that know you need to be here, that desire to be here, that want the healing that's offered here. And that's great, and I'm glad you're here. We were joking a little bit before that I guess we're going to be the only ones with a great summer uh, because we're the ones that are here. So that's good. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we will create a great summer, and we'll laugh at everybody else. No, we won't. We won't. That's not caring. That's not loving. Um, when I was thinking about what makes a great summer, I thought about all the things that I like from summer, going on vacation, swimming, uh, having backyard barbecues, uh, a lot of the stuff I know that Eric mentioned. And that has nothing to do with having a great summer. Those are, those are great things, and they, they bring momentary happiness, but that's not what creates a great summer. What creates a great summer is bringing God into our summer. Um, we were talking about, I don't know if any of you remember this movie, I'll, I'll date myself a little bit, but it was a 90s movie called Point Break. And there's a point at which the sort of surfing guru is talking to the new guy, and he starts talking about the spiritual connection between the ocean and the, and the waves and the timing of life and all this kind of stuff. And one guy says to the other one, are you going to start chanting? And he said, I might. So I might start chanting up here. I don't know. We're going to talk about spiritual things, talk about what's underneath the surface of what we do. Um, someone pointed out to me, someone smarter than me, pointed out to me that in the creation story in Genesis, God says often, let there be, let there be, let there be light. And it occurred to me as I was praying and thinking about this lesson that creating the great, the best summer ever is really about getting out of the way. It's about allowing God into those places and into our summer and into the new rhythms. Because whether we like it or not, summer's got a different rhythm. It's a different season. We have things like weddings and graduations. And uh, because we can't take a trip during the school year, there are vacations. So these things are real, and they do change our rhythm, but we have to guard what's important. We may have to make sacrifices. Um, Eric talked about recovery, and I can remember, uh, I, I too am in recovery, have been for a long, long time, and I can remember in the beginning not going certain places and doing certain things because that wasn't safe for me to do. I had to sacrifice some of what I thought would be fun for what was more important, and that is my life and my sobriety. So all of us have those things. Uh, we, we heard about finances tonight. You know, I might want to fly out to California, but maybe it's going to be a couple weekend trips to Cincinnati this year. We have to guard what's important. But underneath all of that is guarding our hearts. Proverbs 4.23 says, Guard your hearts above all else, for it determines the course of your life. And uh, I thought, well, why is that? Well, because the language of the heart is love. And love is God's language because God is love. So if we're guarding our hearts and we're guarding the rhythm of our heart, then we're guarding our relationship with God. So we put our heart first. Um, the Bible doesn't say, as a man thinketh in his mind. It says, as a man thinketh in his heart. And um, just kind of an aside, I've done some research in the last few years. They are finding neuro pathways, neural pathways, mental pathways, thinking pathways in the heart. So, huh, God knows something. Anyway, um, when we don't do that, when I don't do that, and I, I want to say that, I, this was something else God placed on my heart. I've had a lot of folks assume things about my life because I'm a pastor. Do you know why I'm a pastor? Because God told me to be a pastor. I'm not a pastor because I'm better. I'm not a pastor because I don't have hurts, habits, and hang-ups. I'm a pastor because I'm obedient to the Lord, and this is what he called me to do. There are no big eyes and little U's in the kingdom of God. Let me say that again. There are no big eyes and little U's in the kingdom of God. We're all brothers and sisters. We're all broken and hurting and lost and all need Jesus the same. Okay? So I, I, this is an honor for me to be up here, and that's it. There's no other reason I'm up here talking. Um, when I put things in front of my heart, guarding my heart, those things, those things get my adoration. Those things get my love. I looked up priority, and it said, whatever you give the most importance to. So when I start giving importance to, well, it's summer, I should have fun, I should be free, I can, you know, I don't need to get up and read scripture every day, I don't need to pray the way I pray during the winter, it's summer, it's laid back, I don't need to do those things. What happens is whatever energy I was giving to the Lord, I will start giving to something else, and those things are called idols, and they become the gods in our life. Maybe, maybe believe it or not, it could be relaxing in a chair outside and getting a tan, that could become my idol. Whatever I'm giving my love and my energy and my attention to is my God for that moment. 
So always keeping God first, always guarding our hearts so that we don't slip into idolatry. And it's really easy to do. And an idol can be a person, place, or a thing. It can be a way of thinking. It can be an activity. Um, my wife and I were talking this weekend about, you know, moderation in all things means in all things. Um, you know, people will brag about, well, I, I, run, I run every day and I run marathons. Well, that's good. But you could also be at a soup kitchen while you're instead of running a marathon. And I'm not saying running a marathon is bad. I'm saying running a marathon and making running a marathon your God is bad, making that an idol. We can make anything, even healthy things, healthy things, an idol. So guarding our heart and keeping God first. Eric also talked about continuing to do the things we know that works. I'm going to use recovery as an example. If you go to two or three recovery meetings a week through the spring and the fall, then you need to go to two or three recovery meetings in the summer. If you are working on your finances right now, you should probably continue to work on your finances in the summer. Summer's a fun time. Summer's a good time. Rhythms change. What we need to do for ourselves and our health does not change. I can't say that enough. That those healthy things, those good things we do, those things don't change. Those needs don't change. Um, I kind of felt like the Lord was putting on my heart to kind of challenge challenge you guys tonight. Um, and I, I want to challenge you with this. I want to challenge you that I, I think, and I'm including myself in this, everybody in this room has something tonight they need to surrender. Whether it's an idea of what summer was going to be like, whether it's holding on to control over something in your life, everybody in here has something that they need to let go of tonight, that they need to give to the Lord. And a good friend of mine uh, that was my mentor for years used to say, lay it at the feet of Jesus. So what do you need to lay at the feet of Jesus? What do you need to give him? And that's none of my business. I'm not telling you you have to tell anybody. I'm saying that's between you and God. But thinking about what do you need to surrender tonight? What do you need to give up as you move into the summer? Maybe it's, maybe it's summer. Maybe you know, COVID was, this year was crazy. I know there are school schools that are going to make kids go to school during the summer this year to make up for what they, I mean, a lot of people are, are still out of whack for everything that's been going on. So maybe you just need to have acceptance and maybe what you're surrendering is the desire or need to be in control of that. Um, we talk a lot in recovery about the right form of dependence. I know that I'm, gonna, I'm speaking from personal experience when I say this, that I thought for a long time that what I was fighting for and looking for was independence because I was a very dependent person. I was dependent on people. I was dependent on drugs. I was dependent on food. I was dependent on all these things for, for peace and for joy and for sleep, for anything. I was dependent. I was dependent. So I thought my journey is about independence, and God wants me to be free. He wants me to live free. And who doesn't associate summer with freedom, right? From the time you're a kid and school gets out, summer is freedom. That's freedom. Woo! I'm free. <laughs> but that's not what the Lord is asking us and calling us to. He's calling us to two forms of dependence, and they're the right forms of dependence. And the first one, of course, is dependence on him. He wants to be our peace. He wants to be our joy. He wants to be our rest, our sleep. He wants us to be dependent on him. And instead of independence, we're practicing the right form of dependence. But the second one is just as important. It's going to sound really familiar to you in a minute. So if our first dependence is on him, our second dependence is our interdependence on one another. What are the two greatest commandments? Love God, love your neighbor. Those are the two right forms of dependence. Dependence on God, interdependence on one another. Practice being a neighbor this summer. Right? I think about this all the time with my neighbors. I have great neighbors. I'm the, I'm the loud, obnoxious neighbor. I have kids, and they're, they don't have kids. And I know we're like the loud neighbor. They're awesome. And I think all the time, I don't reach out to them enough. I don't, I, we just kind of like live our own lives, but next to each other all the time. Where's the interdependence? Where's the connectivity? Where's the community within our neighborhood? So maybe this summer, make a point to get out and know your neighbors and be a community and be connected. But practice interdependence. Dependence on God first and interdependence on one another. I think the last thing, I'll, I'll read Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Be anxious for nothing, 
But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So we started by talking about the thing that we need to guard most is our heart. And it says, through prayer, by entering into relationship with the Lord, he will guard our hearts and our minds. How cool is that? So God never asks us to do anything that he's not going to help us with, that he's not going to he's not going to be with us in. And that's the same with guarding our hearts, guarding our summer. I started by saying that God allows things and that one of the first lines I wrote when I was when I was going over this and I'm wrapping up here is it's not so much about creating the best summer ever, ever, but allowing the best summer ever. And so as you sit here tonight and you were thinking about what you need to surrender and you're thinking about what you need to give to God, what is it that's blocking you from having the best summer ever? It's not COVID. It's not. I'm sorry. It's not COVID. It's not your church. It's not whether church is meeting in person or online. That's not blocking you to your best summer ever. It's not your spouse. Well... No, it's not your spouse, it's not your kids, it's not your job, it's not, none of those things determine whether you have a great summer or not, you do, and really to the point at which you're willing to get out of the way. You know, the fruit of the Spirit, one of the big fruits of the Spirit that I love is joy, is that joy that effervesces and, and bubbles over in us, that we don't put there, that God puts there through His, through his presence and His Spirit. And if you're not feeling that, if you're not feeling that when you think about summer, if you're not feeling that when Grace at 11 is up here rocking us out, then something is blocking that because that's a natural fruit of the Spirit. So what is blocking the sunlight of the Spirit? Worry less about the sunlight on your deck and more about the sunlight of the Spirit this summer. What's blocking that? What do you need to get out of the way, right? And we've got a group for it. We've, we will encourage you. We will get you where you need to go. We take a break from a lot of our groups, but we never take a break from Celebrate Recovery or our Celebration Chapel. There's always a place for you. If you just want to hang out, if you just need prayer, or if you want to attend one of those, we'd love to have you. But there's always going to be someone here to love you and to encourage you and to help you. And like I said, this isn't necessarily for the people who need it. It's for the people who want it. All of you want it or you wouldn't be here. Encourage your neighbors, love your neighbors, encourage them to want it. But I just want to say to you that guard your hearts, guard what's important in your life, guard your rhythms, guard the things you know that are good for you. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end in a prayer. I wasn't going to do that, but I'm feeling led to do that. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are, uh, we are fortunate, those of us who are here, because we know, we know where we're broken, we know where we're lost, we know where we need you. Lord, if anyone's here and they're struggling tonight, and they, maybe they don't exactly know why they're struggling. They just know things aren't right. They know they're not feeling right, and they want to be involved. And Lord, just, just give them discernment and clarity. Um, give them the strength and, the, and the, um, the bravery, if you will, to step up and to talk and to ask for help. And Lord, I just pray that if, if um, there's something heavy weighing on someone tonight, a burden, Lord, that, that they would leave it here. Um, that uh, they would leave it at your feet, leave it at the altar, Lord, not take it with them, that they wouldn't allow it any longer to block your spirit, to block your love, to block the flow of your energy and power um, in their life. Lord, you shared with me recently that grace is the intersection of your love and power. And so, Lord, I just pray abundant grace into the lives here tonight, abundant grace into their summer. Lord, you tell us your grace is sufficient to accomplish all things. So, Lord, just, just grace. Just pour out your grace on this room and on the people in this room, on their families. Lord, be a salve to any wounds. Be a solution to any problems. And thank you again, Lord, for all the leaders and the volunteers and the folks that made tonight happen. And thank you so much for Grace at 11 and the energy and love that they bring in their music. Lord, let us worship and give our hearts to you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.
have something serious to talk to you about before I get to that. I want to remind everybody as you dismiss, there are snacks and drinks and ice cream out there. Please feel free to grab that. If you're here for a group, many of you are having your last group for the, the season before you come back in August. Um, so you're, you, when we dismiss, you'll be free to go to those groups. If you have any questions about where something is, um, please let us know. But before we close this evening, I really felt like we needed to um, do kind of an old-fashioned altar call. If you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we would love to pray with you, talk with you, help you uh, walk through that decision and choice. So I'm going to ask our care team to come up. They're going to spread out along the stage. Um, but I also want to just invite you if you feel like it's time in your life to rededicate yourself to Christ. Maybe you gave your life to Christ a long time ago and you have really kind of gone off the path, so to speak, and you want to come back and be with him and close to him in relationship with him and rededicate yourself to Christ. We'd also like to call you forward. And last but not least, if you just, you know what, I, after hearing everybody speak, I want to dedicate my summer to the Lord. I want to, I want to guard those rhythms sure that I'm walking as strongly with God in the summertime as I am the rest of the year. If that's, if any of those are you, we want to invite you forward right now. Come up to one of our care team and they would love to talk with you and pray with you. And for the rest of you, uh, Grace at 11 is going to kind of play us out. I'm just going to encourage you to, to find your way to your group and again, to grab a snack or some ice cream or something on your way out. But let me just uh, pray one more time for us. Heavenly Father, um, you're so good. You're so good. So, Lord, if there's someone here tonight that doesn't know you, Lord, I just pray that uh, you would inspire them, that you would encourage them, that you would convict them, that their heart would be bent towards you. And, Lord, we would love to just have them come up and pray with us. God, I thank you so much for those that have realized they've strayed and they want to be back on the narrow path. And, Lord, those that say, you know what, I, I, I've never really given my summer. I've always seen my summer as my own time, but I want to give that to the Lord this year. I want to give my summer to God. Lord, we just pray for those folks that they would come forward, uh, that they would, uh, uh, Lord, just confess with their tongue, and uh, whether literally or, or figuratively, Lord, and be on bended knee. And Lord, we love to just pray with them. So Lord, bless everyone here as they go out.